Now, the news of the day from Nicholas Witchell and news of the week from Moira Stewart in Newsview. Good evening. The news of the week is overshadowed by one event, the disaster last night in the English Channel. At least 49 died, 79 are missing, feared dead, aboard the British ferry Herald of Free Enterprise. But hundreds more survived, plucked in darkness from the sea, a night of anguish, Mrs Thatcher called it. The Duke and Duchess of York have been to Belgium to express the Queen's deep shock and sadness. Tonight, the cause of the disaster is still a mystery. The big question, did the ferry's doors somehow come open? Through darkness and daylight, teams of divers from four different countries have been searching the stricken British car ferry, the Herald of Free Enterprise, for signs of life. She capsized carrying nearly 540 people, most of them British, at almost exactly this time last night. For those on board, there was almost no chance to don life jackets or board lifeboats. She foundered in moments, turning on her side and throwing people into the chill waters of the channel about a mile off the Belgian port of Zeebrugge. The rescue services of Belgium, Holland, France and Britain, both civil and military, went to their assistance. And tonight it's known that 409 people were saved, but 79 are still missing. For them, the experts say there is now little or no hope. So far, the bodies of 49 people have been recovered. The Queen is said to be deeply shocked and saddened at the disaster. She sent her deepest sympathy to the families of the dead. The Prime Minister said she was devastated at the extent of the tragedy. This afternoon, she travelled to Belgium to meet survivors. Tonight, the Herald of Free Enterprise is still on her side, stranded on a sandbank. Our first report is from Triona Holden. The daylight revealed the full horror of what happened last night. The Herald of Free Enterprise lay on her port side, stricken and helpless. Rescue ships were at the scene, hoping that more survivors might be found. One salvage tug was carrying a team of British divers who shared that hope. Their vessel pulled up to the exposed keel of the ferry, and making a precarious link-up, they used a ladder to get onto the vessel. And they searched the area where they believed their expertise could come into the most use. The 11 British divers now working on the ferry face a near impossible task. They say they've already seen three bodies and now they're having to decide which areas of the ferry to start cutting into. They're hoping to find air pockets and possibly survivors. But as one diver put it to me, if anyone has lived this long, it would be a miracle. As they searched, the divers found evidence everywhere of the scale of the disaster. They said the angle of the ship made it difficult for them to work. Few things had remained in their place in the force of the accident. They found themselves walking along what would normally be walls. At one point, a flight of stairs could be seen at a 90 degree angle. Despite the problems though, the divers said they were going to continue searching for hours, as long as it took to find survivors. No, they're taking... Where's Gordon gone? That's straight down onto the engine control room there. Happened. Everyday items lay scattered all over the place. Unused life jackets reflected how quickly it all happened. The divers said that they would cover all of the ferry if possible in their attempt to find anyone alive. Broken windows showed how rescuers last night smashed them in desperation to pull out passengers who'd been trapped behind thick glass. The divers said the shattered glass hampered their progress cutting into their wetsuits and injuring them. Items of passengers' clothing still littered the ferry. The divers kept hoping to find people alive. Instead, they discovered bodies, including those of two children. They said the search was a harrowing ordeal, and it was made almost impossible by the conditions on board. Meanwhile, other ferries in the Townsend Torreson fleet tried to get on with work as normal. First, the plates slid gently off the restaurant tables. Then suddenly, the tables, the chairs and people crashed sideways and downwards. The windows were underwater, the water burst in, and the ship was in darkness. 
the sea was already inside down below and it was just a matter of seconds as the ferry lurched onto her side. The rescue operation was coordinated within 15 minutes. Tugs and harbour boats raced alongside. RAF helicopters arrived to join the Belgians. Some people had already managed to crawl up onto the ship's side. As the rescue teams arrived, they could see people trapped beneath the windows, which were horizontal. They hacked and smashed the strong glass. They lowered ropes and hauled people out. Below, there was chaos. People clawing and fighting their way up, injured and freezing cold. Survival time in the water was estimated at 20 minutes at most. This was the scene on top of the hull as the divers went to search the flooded compartments. They soon reported seeing bodies. The tugs stood by to carry them on shore. As survivors were winched up or taken off by a flotilla of tugs and rescue craft, every available medical team was sent to the area. Hospitals in nearby Bruges and Blankenburg dealt with scores of people with cuts, bruises, hypothermia and shock. The Herald's captain was one of several people in intensive care. He told doctors that he'd heard a crash before his ship capsized. Many of the passengers were families on a day's outing across the channel. They were still finding their seats, heading for the restaurant bars. They were split up and didn't know where their relatives or friends were. It was clear to many who survived that people near them or in the same room or passageway had been lost. One woman said that her husband had made himself a human bridge so that she and her daughter could climb up and across him to safety. She called to him to follow her, but he said, no, there are others here who have to get out. That was the last she saw of him. Others who were separated were luckier. We were just trying to find things to hang on to because mm. the force of the water was breaking the tables up and we've got cuts and bruises all around our legs where mm. things were coming mm. and hitting us, you see. And, that, and all the chairs were literally just breaking up. We just had to grab hold of what we could. How long were you actually in water for? It could have been about half an hour, that I don't know, because it was so cold and we just didn't... We didn't bother to really think we would... Ju all we wanted to do was get out. We just... It was so frightening, it really yeah, was. What, what were there any the messages? Any well, my daughter up, was upstairs with yeah. her boyfriend because we split... We said two of us would go to dinner first yeah. and have all the luggage upstairs, the yeah. others would, and then we'd take it in turn. So, oh, we, so they were upstairs? Yes, we yeah. don't know where they were. So there, yeah, well, we yeah. don't know. This we don't know. What's your name? Maureen, Maureen Bennett. You were, you were over for a day trip, were you? Yes, my we daughter paid for it for our wedding anniversary. Right. Did you come with the sun? Yes, we did. Yes, we were. I hope they never, ever do that trip again. Where are you from, Mrs. Bennett? Crawley in Sussex. Oh, cool. uh, I have good news. I've just heard that she's alive. She's a... Uh, Oh, uh, uh, right, she's alive. She's alive. Teresa is. Teresa. Thank God. My girl and myself were in the restaurant sitting actually next to the window. Um, the vessel seemed to dip slightly to the left. Uh, things started rolling off tables very gradually at first. Uh, then it became more severe. Um, the lady that was working in the restaurant came flying across the, the room. And looking outside, we could see the ship was probably at about uh, I don't know, 30, 40 degree angle. And the windows outside were actually submerged underwater. We were hanging on in that position for, seemed a long while, it was probably three or four minutes, enough to make my arms ache. And all of a sudden, I suspect that the water came in, um, the windows burst, and at that time that the ship actually flipped on its side, sort of almost in an instant. And I think that's when most people went flying about, the water coming in. Uh, made us all try and float up, but being in the restaurant, we were contained by the glass surrounds. Uh, I lost track of my girl then. The only way I got out was by turning some sort underwater and kicking the glass in with my feet. Did the same thing through to the corridor, found myself in the TV room. Uh, the ship then seemed to settle. I found myself floating, facing the ceiling of the TV room. Um, the ship settled down. Then it was really 
in amongst the screaming, trying to get people to settle down uh, and see what else was going to happen. I mean, that was the first thing. The guys that were the crew um, immediately started trying to uh, get up to windows to smash them out. Um, and that's what happened. They, the vessel settled like that on its side. Uh, the crew smashed some windows and we eventually got out. And how were you picked up? Uh, a tug took us away. Uh, we climbed up a rope and the tug took us away. And your girlfriend? I haven't heard you. I came up through the water and got onto the ledge. Uh, there was a lot of shouting and screaming and everyone saying, are you all right, are you all right? It was, everyone was trying to pull together, I think. Then the lights went out, and I mean, that was... Suddenly you're in pitch black darkness in, in icy water, um, and you can't see anything then. Um, and that started again, everyone was screaming then at that point. Um, How that was long were you, were you there on that ledge? Um, I would say maybe like half an hour, 35 minutes. What did you do during that time? Oh, I got a little girl there with me. I pulled her up because she was with her mum and I pulled her over to me out of the water. So I was talking to her mainly because she was so frightened. So I guess it was easy for me then because I'm sort of trying, she was frightened she was going to die. She kept saying we're going to die, we're going to die. And I think the thing that got me most was she said to me, and I've been ever such a good girl. I've never told any lies, and which was quite sweet. And I said, I'm sure that's right, Claire. I'm sure you're not going to die, really. Mrs. Thatcher arrived in Belgium this afternoon. She was flown over the wreck in a helicopter. On her way to visit some of the survivors in hospital, she had particular praise for all the rescuers. It has been a night of anguish for everyone. It has also been a night of great courage and a night of great professionalism and concern on the part of all of the rescue services. I understand that the helicopters were there within six minutes. I understand that every reception center was ready within 16 or 17 minutes, and that all the ambulances were on the quayside, and the first people were received in the hospitals and reception centers within 20 minutes of the accident occurring. This is outstanding and can only have been done by them being highly professional, highly skillful, and very, very courageous. The Duke and Duchess of York also visited Seabrugge. Representing the Queen, they heard first about the helicopter rescues. The Prince apparently asking detailed questions as a naval helicopter pilot himself. The royal couple met some of the divers who've taken part in the rescue operation, hearing accounts of the enormous difficulties confronting them on board the wrecked ferry before the Duke and Duchess went on to visit survivors in hospital. The Belgian authorities have confirmed that about a hundred of those on board the ferry were British servicemen and their families who were on their way across the channel on leave. The servicemen were from various bases in West Germany and a crisis centre was set up at Rheindahlen, the British forces joint headquarters. All day there have been calls coming in from anxious relatives. An army spokesman said that the servicemen had left 20 cars at the quayside at Zeebruggen. He said they often leave their cars there and travel as foot passengers. The spokesman appealed for those who travelled on other ferries to contact the Rheindahlen headquarters as a matter of urgency. Well, since the first news of the disaster last night, relatives of people aboard the ferry have been gathering at Townsend Torrison's Dover offices to wait for information. But staff there are finding the task of compiling a register of survivors particularly difficult because cross-channel ferries, unlike aircraft, don't keep full passengers lists. Overnight, relatives kept up a constant flow of phone calls to Townsend Torrison's Dover offices. Many were from family inquiring about members of the ship's crew, a close-knit group of colleagues recently featured in a local newspaper for their fundraising activities. No more news at all. I'll be in touch. Should I hear any more? I'm here all night. I'll be in touch. Pleasure. Pleasure. Bye-bye. It's Brian's right.